uh, yeah, I'm off my game. My apologies. Uh, you probably heard me. It was probably pretty quiet for the past uh, minute or so. So we'll just go ahead and uh, cut that out of the YouTube recording. <laughs> what are you going to do? All right. Hey, welcome. <laughs> so today we're going to be working on my AT modem package. So I got a new little LTE modem I am playing with. Unfortunately, I ordered the wrong antennas. So the current antennas I have, I think, are for Wi-Fi. And I need LTE antennas because I'm silly and I didn't realize that. So... I've got it plugged into my router, but as far as I can tell, I can't get a usable signal at the moment. So we can at least poke at it and get some statistics off of it. So we're going to do that today. So it should be a good time. So what I have started so far is I have this package here on GitHub I call AT Modem. It is a wrapper over a couple of other packages. So if I go to my Go mod... Uh, we have the tarm serial package, so in order for the modem to be interfaced with through Go, we have to speak to it using a serial port, which on Linux exposes itself as like dev tty usb 0, 1, 2, something like that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also using this uh, Warthog 618 modem package. This is pretty cool. So this actually does a lot of the work of uh, dealing with the modem itself as far as like an IO read writer. And it also provides this, actually we're not using this one, we are using the Let's see here. Are we just using the... We're using the AT package for sure. So the AT package deals with like AT commands in kind of a nice way. It provides some nice things like timeout functionality and such. So we're using this. We're kind of building a high level wrapper on top. Uh, but ultimately the package is pretty easy to test because we can just split this all out into IO readers and writers. So I'll show you all what I've got so far. I swear GitHub used to have a bunch of stuff on the right that they moved to the top. Now they moved to the top back to the right. I guess, I don't know. For the longest time, this stuff was all at the top, but... I don't know. I use GitHub since about 2011 or 12. I can't exactly remember, so it's been a little bit, but pretty sure it was the navigation to the issues, PRs, etc. though, so it's not the same thing going in circles. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this package is pretty cool. This seems like it works pretty well, so we are using this as kind of our base, and we're building on top of that. So what I've got so far is not very much, but we can do a bit more today. So if I want to get back to the code, uh, right, there we go. So basically what I've got so far is we have this AT modem package exposes this device type. Oh, so you have like an old GitHub image here or something, huh, Jimmy? Let's see here. Weird. Okay, I don't know if I remember that, to be honest. Um, that browser looks pretty old, though. So, huh. Interesting. So what we have so far is we have the device type. We have a couple of different constructors. So we have the dial constructor, which opens the serial port using the... Specified port ID, the baud rate. Uh, I believe my modem requires 9600 baud. Um, although it's connecting to it with Minicom and using whatever the default was, like uh, 111 5200. I don't even know what it is. Anyway, uh, we were using that and it would seem to work just fine as well. So I'm confused. But anyway, we also have the open constructor that takes an IO read writer, which the serial port implements. But also, if it's a read write closer, we can close the port as well. So I decided to make the closer part optional um, just for convenience for my tests and such. I guess I could probably just change this to uh, read write closer for more clarity, but it doesn't really matter. We wrap it using this AT package, which I've implemented as AT because I find the AT AT type kind of, uh, the type is called AT.AT .AT, and I don't like that. <laughs> I, I don't know where that convention comes from, but people do that like, you know, config.config .config or AT.AT .AT, and I don't really like that, you know, so... I have renamed it to AT device because I think that more clearly indicates what it's actually doing and the type is still called AT because whatever. Uh, so we initialize it, which will run a couple of commands to essentially reset the state of the modem. Um, it deals with things like flushing SMS messages. This is all kinds of crazy stuff, but doing that and then doing a couple of other things like uh, resetting the modem, I believe, and disabling echo. So that way you get a more concise output. And once we have that, uh, we can just issue it commands. So for example, if I do I, this is the AT info command. This gives me back some lines that I can parse into data. So I will show you all my tests so far and we'll see where we're at with that. Um, so I have the info command fully done and I've got status down below we'll take a look at as well. The basic idea is you issue the modem a command and it will give you some lines of text back and then something like okay. So this is the delimiter that indicates that we're done. So. Uh, assuming the modem did something goofy here and sent us something that has no data, it just gets this okay, this will report an error. We want to check for that. If we get something that looks like a key value pair, but it has no colon, we know the, con the content must be malformed as well, so we report an error. And what I have here is I have a couple of examples from the readme from the modem package. This is a Huawei modem of some sort. And then my Sierra Wireless MC7455, uh, this is the one I just bought. 
I uh, got some of the output from here, updated the firmware and such, got the output, and then replaced things like the MEID and IEMI, IMEI as well. You know, I just realized something. I was going to poke at the modem potentially, but that could potentially expose things to you all, like the IMEI and such. And I'm not sure if there's really like a security concern with that, but there might be. So I guess for today, we're going to stick with just these tests and stuff. We're not actually going to poke at the modem for real, but perhaps I will show you all that sort of thing when we get a Prometheus exporter built, which of course is going to happen as well. So the goal so far is just to take lines like this, parse them into a structure, because this way we can use it in a more well-taped way. Uh, in addition, we get things like the software version, which is an integer, or this GCAP is a list of properties, so things like CGSM, um, there's a couple of other things that can exist here as well. This Huawei modem, as you'll see, reports CGSM, DS, ES. To be clear here, I don't necessarily know what all these capabilities mean as of yet. Uh, I'm still pretty new to the whole modem game, so... Anyway, uh, we got a couple of helpers here. So this with device thing, basically what we're doing here... We open an AT modem device using an arbitrary read-write closer, which in this case is going to feed input from a string. It's going to write output to a bytes buffer, and it uses this response channel in order to uh, move, make the two move in lockstep. So the modem package will continuously be reading for input. So it's basically invoking read the entire time, and it's writing as needed. So we use this channel in order to coordinate that back and forth. So if I show you all that... Basically, we get a write, and we have to do a couple of things first to do the initial handshake, so to speak. So we get the first write, which is the SMS clear escape command. I'm not exactly sure what this does, but something about the SMS state of the modem. The next one we get is ATZ, which will clear the state of the modem, I believe, and we return OK. So we get an input here, we return OK, and then the channel will be unpacked here, and it will return this to the caller. Next, we disable echo because we don't want the device echoing our input back to us. We just want to be able to parse the output. And finally, we do whatever the user said. So things like returning arbitrary input, which we can test for. So the second command I was working on is status. And status looks like this. So given a G status command, um, we'll get this header here and then these key value pairs. And what I noticed about this is current time 71465, temperature 41. So it seems like if there is more than one word in the value, it gets its own line. So for example, LTECA state is the key but the value here is not assigned. And you'll notice there's no more value here. Uh, same thing for here, RRC idle, no serve. So what I'm noticing is that if there are multiple key value pairs on one line, the value seems to be just one string. So I can abuse this fact to actually parse these so we can go through this as current time and then temperature, reset counter mode, uh, while gathering the entire key and the value but for this one, you can actually have multiple words. So for example, you can have like LTE BW bandwidth, I think, uh, five megahertz. That works just fine. So I wrote a pretty silly little parser so far that takes care of this. Uh, I guess first we'll go through the info. The info format is a little easier. So we just get this uh, right here. Manufacturer this, model this, revision this. These are all key value pairs, one per line, pretty easy. So we check for the colon, we split at the colon, and then look at the string, which is something like manufacturer, and we parse the string into a different field. So easy enough, go through the switch, do a couple of conversions here if needed. We're going to end up factoring out a type that can parse these in a more concise way. Uh, I will probably, I guess we could potentially do that tonight. That could be kind of a cool thing. It's something I've discussed before in a couple of my blogs, but uh, it could probably be worth doing. Um... But for the status stuff, it's a bit more complicated. So we send the gstatus command, we call this parse status. And kind of the algorithm I've come up with here is look for the number of colons. And if there's one colon, we know it's a single key value pair, we can parse the entire line as is. If there are two colons, we know, we can assume that after the colon, the index of the colon plus two is the index of the second key value pair. So the first key value pair is all of the string slice values up until that point. And then by taking that index, adding two, so for the index of the key itself with the colon, and then the value, and then the index of the next key value pair, we can actually split this. So we parse the first part and parse the second part. And this seems to work pretty well. So there's probably a smarter way to do this. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at this, like, you know, string math thing. <laughs> so it seems to work fine. And then the parsing function itself will just give any key value pair, iterate them two at a time, parse the key as a full string, parse the value possibly as a slice, which we may reinterpret as a string or whatever else. So this is what I have so far. We are parsing the current time and the temperature from 
this output. And probably what we'll do first is factor out a more concise parser type. So the goal being that we get something like uh, s current time equals value parser dot duration. Something like that. So this will all go away. And down here, we'll have an error check. So this is actually a pattern I have discussed in the past. So if I go to my blog, by the way, I wrote a blog the other day about the Go generics draft design. Uh, this got some pretty good traction on things like Hacker News and Reddit. I was pretty happy about that. So check this out. We will probably be doing some generics streams as well, playing with that. I don't want to go into that today because we only have a couple of hours. So I want to keep working on this project because I've got a good direction here. But I also wrote this blog, so Exploring Byte Parsing APIs in Go. This was part of the Gopher Academy as well. <laughs> I've got two out of five K points needed for code review. Oh boy, <laughs> should be fun. Yes, we do have a channel point reward where I can do a code review. Uh, I probably wouldn't do one tonight, but I would put you down for next time for sure. So in this blog, I talked about my Netlink package. We ran into the same problem where we had to figure out how to parse this data in a concise way. So at first I had to do these things that have like error checking and you got to worry about variable shadowing and such. So I ended up coming up with this iterator API where the basic idea is you iterate the key value pairs, you try and parse this as UN16, but if this is not a UN16, there'll be an error returned for this point here. So we're going to build this exact same sort of thing for this and that way we can parse these key value pairs in a concise way. So I think this is a cool little pattern. And actually, I'm pretty sure there was a Go blog at one point about this as well. Something very similar. So let's get to work on that. The old Rob Pike Lexer. I think you might be right. I can't remember if it was the Lexer or not, but I think you might be right. It was something about error handling. Uh, I don't exactly remember. So package AT modem type value parser struct. So given a set of inputs, we want to be able to produce outputs. So, oh, what do I want? Um, we want to be able to use this in both places. So instead of this being a string, string slice one, still an array of strings. So I think given a slice of string input, we're going to want to produce a value, one value per line. So this is going to look something like this, the input as well as the error. So we create a value parser. Given a set of inputs, should this consume the entire lines? Is that what I want here? Because in theory, we can make it so that you give it a full string, it does the splitting for you, and then can give you key value pairs and iterate through them. That could be kind of nice. But I'm not sure how that would work for this. We could potentially make this smarter and uh, move this code in here as well. So that way the value parser can handle either one key value pair or multiple. I think for today, we're going to do this the simple way and maybe look into the more advanced route. But I just want to give you all the point of what I'm getting at. So we create a value parser. Uh, let's see here. Given an input string slice. Uh, I guess we don't really need this constructor. I just kind of like these for tidiness, you know. So this is gonna have methods, for example, parsing an integer at a specified index maybe. So what I was thinking of, for example, is this LTE bandwidth line. For our code, we don't care about parsing the megahertz part. We know it's megahertz, so we just wanna be able to parse this five. So given a string slice input, uh, do we wanna make it so that you can pass in like an index here, like pass in index zero for here or index one? I'm just not sure if that's necessary. So I think for the time being, we're probably going to hard code it as index zero, but I guess we'll see. Um, hmm. So the first method we're going to add is integer. That seems like a good idea. So given a value parser, we have int, which will return the int primitive type. Uh, so in order to have a valid integer, you have to have at least one entry in the slice. So I think we're going to to do assume to do. Uh, parameterize the index unclear if needed so if len vp dot string slice equals zero there's nothing for us to parse god forbid anyone put one thing per line yeah it's kind of kind of silly like they would do this ooh, excuse me it's kind of silly they would do it this way um 
This seems like, you know, human readable input clearly or human readable output clearly, but I'm guessing tools parse this for things like the temperature as well. So we just have to deal with it. Uh, error. Error F, uh, value parser. Uh, let's see here. No values in input string slice. So this is probably gonna be an error we return throughout. So error, no values, something like that. Error, no values equals, oh, we have to give it a type, don't we? For function call, right. Okay, uh, that means there's nothing we can do. We return zero and this way it will return a value that's technically valid, but it's up to the caller to inspect the error. So, we add the error method, error, error, return VP error. So if length equals zero, but what we also wanna do is we wanna short circuit any parsing logic. So as soon as you run into an error with this thing, we want it to no longer bother doing any work because there's just nothing that can be done anyway. So you've already encountered an error. There's no point in doing like additional string manipulation and such. So VP error not equals nil. Turn zero. This means that, you know, no op shortcut out. So the way you would use this is a uh, device. Yeah, right. <laughs> we can start using it like right here, for example. So this stircom function, let's see, what do we do here? So we're just assuming there's two elements here. String slice, remove any extra white space before parsing. Yeah, I guess that is something I would want, huh? Hmm. So this takes a single string, but the other one would take multiple strings. So I'm trying to think of what the right API is. I think it's probably still a slice. Um, I think what we might do is something kind of silly for the time being. So we do something like VP new value parser, give it an input, which is a string slice, which will be, this is really silly, but Right, I mean, this way it is a slice with one element. Um, and I guess we probably want a strings trim space. Maybe I can make it so that this does that internally. <laughs> so given a string output. Huawei modems apparently have an XML RPC API. Uh, wow, that is, uh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Googling to see if other people parse this stuff. Ah, okay, cool. Thank you, I appreciate that. I haven't done very much research yet. So the way we use this is I, I am at, I M E I S V. That is a mouthful. Ugh, it's been a long day. VP int. And all this error checking goes away. Because we now do it after the loop. So if error, VP error, not equals nil, return. And that is basically how the pattern works. So what this will do is this will, this will save you a lot of verbosity in the switches and such. Because you really don't want a stirconv A2I check in every single case that has an integer, right? It seems kind of silly. So... This is a pattern I have applied a lot before in code. I really like it. Um, let's see. So we probably want, we probably want to uh, return a string, I think, right? So these are gonna be something like VP string. And I guess in this case, it's a little unfortunate. You have to have like manufacturer, manufacturer, model, model, but without relying on reflection, which I frankly don't like for this sort of thing. I know some people think, oh, reflection is so, it's so much more concise. But the thing is, if you're writing Go code, <laughs> you don't usually expect things to be concise, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so this would be a string. So this would be VP string, but split into, so the, the key value pair parses this as a string, but this is actually going to be split into a slice anyway, because it is a comma separated list of values. So this is exactly what we want, that's fine. We could potentially move this into a helper function. I don't see a need right now. Um, yeah, anyway. Oh man, hope you all had a nice day. Um, for those who are fortunate enough to have fathers in their lives, I hope you were able to uh, spend some time, you know, at least get a hold of your parents today. Um, for those who are parents, happy Father's Day to you all. I am not a parent, but I was able to talk to my parents and spend some time with my girlfriend's parents as well, which was quite nice, so. Had to uh, help rebuild a swing outside today. That was pretty fun. Lifting up some pretty heavy, uh, pretty heavy boards and stuff. <laughs> but it was a good time. 
Black Martian, thank you so much for the follow. For the follow. Ugh. Long day. Long day. I don't usually stream at night, you know? Kind of weird. 2D parameterize the index. Yeah, I think this is probably going to be a common thing, so... Uh, apologies, we didn't actually finish this function. So VPSS1, uh, we need to infer as a string, or as a integer. Uh, right, so kind of A2I. You could put the values in, the values in a map string interface IDK. Yes, I could potentially, but the thing is with that is that involves lots of type assertions on the color side. So in this case, I have basically I have key values of string string. So instead of putting them in like empty interface, I want to just parse them all as strings and then just use it, deal with them as strings. The thing is with map string interfaces, I really don't like that data type because it is a bucket of named things and those things can be literally anything so for example like you know what's to say that a channel doesn't end up in your map of string interface right so i, I tend to prefer avoiding that type whenever possible but that's just me uh vp error equals the error return zero so anytime there's an error we have to return zero or return the zero value for the type as well as set the error field right so this should compile now so we have integer we have string VP SS one. So this is this is strange. Hmm. And I think probably what I want here is strings join, maybe, because you would actually want the rest of the slice. Because some of these fields have multiple words after the status string. So if I look at, for example, the what is it? Revision, SWIX, 930R2, all this stuff. Like, in theory, you want to join everything together. So I suspect probably what I want here, actually, is strings join uh, every string from one on with a space. I think will be sufficient. Um, and as far as the integer goes, again, this could potentially exist at other indices, but I think we're probably going to leave it this would not be one because this is already the value. So we want zero. So in this case, I think we also want zero, right? Yeah, because we're already inserting one. We're not handling keys here at all. We could potentially handle keys as well. That would be where we would subsume the logic. We probably take a string as input and convert it into these key value pairs ourselves and do like an iterator in here. But we're not doing that yet. We are just doing the values. So... It is very likely that I will expand this type. I may not do it tonight, depending on the amount of time we have, because I've got a hard cutoff of 10 p.m., so 90 more minutes. So, uh, yeah, we'll just join the whole thing. That seems fine. So, given a, given these inputs, we parse outputs, okay? So we have the value parser. Um, remove any extra white space. Yeah, yeah, these have white space. We don't want any surrounding white space. So we'll do that in here, actually, I think. So for i colon equals range ss, we do the string here, strings, trim, space. So we want to trim all of the leading and trailing white space because we just don't want it. It's going to complicate things. Regex101.com. Oh, here we go. Key value regex. Nice. Yeah, you know, I thought about doing regex as well for this, but I really wasn't sure about. Did you cut? You didn't copy this from the stream, did you? You probably copied it from the. You probably copied it from the uh, repo itself. Yeah, this is pretty good. This seems to work. Um, so the the regex I was just sent. It, I'll I'll drop the link. I love this website, by the way. Um, regex to parse at commands. Interesting. Okay, cool. Oh, uh, yeah, this seems to work pretty well. Um, normal service. It does not pick up this part. Or I think this is a copy-paste error, actually, because I'm pretty sure this was, like, a different line. Anyway, this does seem this does seem pretty good. The thing is, is I was actually trying to avoid regex. I figured I could do this pretty simply with the looking at the position of the colons. So what I have for now seems to work. Uh, that being said, I will put this as a to-do, and I will credit you. So thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll put it as a to-do for something to evaluate, at least. Although, I would probably prefer to avoid regex if possible. So, to-do, consider a regex-based parsing approach. If 
it turns out the format is more complex than anticipated. Oh, uh, yeah, totally. So it's kind of funny. I, I worked with a guy once at a PHP shop. Um, so example. Thanks. Cockies. Cockies? Cockies? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I actually worked with a coworker once in a PHP shop who really liked regex, and he wrote some pretty incomprehensible ones. Frankly, I don't think this one's bad at all. This seems pretty, uh, if you, the thing is for me is I never, like, am good at reading regex, but if I actually sit down here and think about this, like, okay, uh, match any non-white space character one or more times, like, that makes a lot of sense, right? But I think we can avoid regex for now, but we'll definitely leave the to-do, so thank you, I appreciate it. But I think this isn't too bad, actually. I think this turned out kind of nice. It's kind of elegant in the way that you can just call the parse function for either the whole thing or part of the thing, you know. Uh, that being said, I should probably fuzz this because I probably got this wrong. Regexper.com. I am not familiar. I actually use Regex 101 all the time. So, interesting. Good to know. Parameterize the index. Uh, let's see here. It generates a flowchart from an expression. Interesting. That's cool. How many times have I said interesting in the past uh, five minutes? <laughs> My apologies. So this will trim all the space for us so we don't have to care about out here anymore, which is great. Um, yeah, this, this works. Let's see if we can incorporate this down here as well. So the goal would be... Oh, I think that didn't URL escape properly or Twitch messed it up. Let me, uh, oh, that's cool. Okay. So if I go to this regex per, uh, wrong link, one sec. That's pretty cool, actually. So non-white space, continue. You look for either skipping ahead to this. Huh, that's neat. It's a cool website. Thank you for sharing. Hey, large data bank. Welcome back. Thank you so much for the two months. I'm pretty sure you were my first two month subscriber. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks a ton. I really need to set up my alerts, don't I? <laughs> oh, let's see here. What was I gonna do? I always misclick the crying face for some reason. Set up those alerts. Yeah, I will, I will. I just keep forgetting, honestly. My apologies. <laughs> I don't think about it until I'm about to, like five minutes from streaming, you know? I saw you did a stream earlier today. Hope it went well. Uh, my apologies that I could not hang out. I was busy uh, helping build a swing set outside. It was a lot of fun. So, oh yeah, check out those error checks. Lots of those in this code for sure. You know, you know, Go Go is not an elegant language. You know, it took me uh, you know ten lines to write this function. So, <laughs> what are you gonna do? Uh, short circuit, short circuit. Good, good. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, let's incorporate this over here. So. This parsing function, actually, we can use it as well. So a key is the string up to this point, and then the value is going to be the value parser till after that point. So, oops, what did I just do? I promised my friend I'd raid him tonight, but I'm annoyed I didn't raid you. My friend didn't notice I raided him. Oh no, that's a bummer. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of easy to miss, especially if your chat's going pretty fast, but I've got the activity feed in a separate place, so I should be able to see it. ATI0. Is that information zero? Because I'm familiar with ATI, but I'm not sure what I0 would do. Would that give you no information? That'd be a very useful command, right? Or with stream alerts. Yes, I should set up a raid alert. Uh, it's kind of funny because Laser Belt has the, the Guile theme, I think, from... Was it Street Fighter? Yeah? Street Fighter? No. I never played those games, but he's got the Guile theme or whatever, and it's like a great raid alert. It's pretty cool. New value parser. Hey, Taryn, uh, get your modem working so you can test my code, please. Thanks. Guile is Street Fighter. Yeah, it's just like a pretty catchy theme. So I can do, I don't really need duration helper for now. I can just do integer. So VP int. And VP int. Isn't this great? Like, I, I get that. You know, you might not like this in some ways because it's going to do some level of work and it's going to assign something here. But if you assign the zero value, I feel like it's pretty harmless, right? And as long as you're doing the error check immediately, you're going to catch it. Because otherwise, like, if you get to, if you don't do the error check until outside the loop, 
then you're going to miss errors and do more work. So I, I think this approach is pretty good. And it's worth noting that even though this package or this type is within my package, I'm still using this error accessor or like this error uh, method. I still like to kind of pretend like I'm using an unexported API or an exported API, even if it's within my package. I know this is kind of silly maybe, but this way it's easy to go back and do things like retrofit a mutex or whatever else later on if you need to. So it's easier in that way. So I think that given these changes, these tests should pass. Let's see here. They do not. Ah, we have a leading white space. Interesting. Why? Uh, oh, does this contain a leading string? It might. Let's see here. Hey, Taryn, thank you so much for the two-month subscription. I appreciate that. First two-month folks today. Very cool. Uh, watch out, I lost some sub points, so uh, it's going to be a while until we get more emotes. So <laughs> I think you need 35 subscribers to get to the fourth emote slot, and I had 25 at the max. Um, but I'm down to 19. It's okay. It doesn't actually matter. You do not have to subscribe. No worries. I will probably give out some gift subs at some point when we get close. Uh, otherwise, don't worry about it. But if you have a Twitch Prime subscription, I would appreciate your Twitch Prime sub. So <laughs> uh, let's see here. I want to print the print F. Send Q. Uh-oh, we got a hype train. Dot Waffle, thank you so much for continuing the gift sub you got from me. I really appreciate that. Hype train level one. Scam train activated. So funny. Yeah, so this seems fine. What's going on here? A B C D. So it's getting a tr it's getting a leading string from the ha uh, what? Is there an empty string in here somewhere? Hang on a sec. What am I looking at? First one's free, then you're an addict. Yeah. I mean, I think you can you can you can prime sub every month if you want to, you know. But no big deal. I do not require anybody to you know i'm never gonna have like sub only streams or i think it's not gonna happen so don't worry either way weird yeah same thing there why do these have leading strings leading spaces that's very strange see i would think that it would trim that right when i put it in the value parser didn't i have it set to do that so, am I doing something wrong here? Oh, I... <laughs> I just broke this. If you won't, I'd have sub-only streams. If you won't, what? I think I missed it. Hey, nice. Uh, large data bank. Thank you for the 100 bits. Uh, I have no TTS at the moment, but I appreciate that 100 bits. Thank you. I think those are the first bits in my channel, actually, too. That's kind of cool. Trim space, yes. For every element of the string, we want the spaces removed because that's that problem there. But it's still present for this FSN and I have no idea why. Uh... Oh, you accidentally a word, I see. Any recommendations for an interactive terminal library for Go? I think XSSH term, maybe, something like that. I know about this one. I know about this package terminal in crypto SSH. I don't know about a more general one. I mean, it looks like this works over just an IO read writer. Like you don't even, I don't think you'd even need an SSH connection, but I don't know for sure. In this case, my application isn't interactive. It's just purely uh, reading data from the serial interface. So, uh, by the <laughs> by the way, I ditched the idea of get sock out and decided to grab TCP stuff using Netlink instead. Yeah, the TCP stat family, something like that. And it turns out it's impossible to Google anything related to Go and Netlink without your blog popping up. Yes, that was the goal, right? I think actually if you just Google Netlink stuff in general, I'm pretty pretty near the top because lots of people haven't uh, written about it. So yeah, I hope it was helpful. <laughs>
if you check out my, I think TCP stats are the GE netlink, right? So if you make a generic netlink package for that, uh, please feel free to send me a link and we can include it in the readme as part of the netlink ecosystem. So it'd be cool. So where is this string coming from? Excuse me. I don't understand. Hugo Marius, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate that. Your Netlink library is amazing. I really appreciate it. I used it extensively in an init RAM FS replacement I wrote. Nice. Uh, please do, please do link me to that if it's available. I'd be very curious to see it. Do I need to send a PR to include mine in the readme? Yes, please do. I appreciate that. I actually ended up using a different library. What? Come on. <laughs> uh, I know there's the the Vishvananda. Yeah. Oh, so you did you write code to do that? Oh, so somebody else writ, wrote the code. Interesting. I not die again. The thing is with this library, I, I've mentioned it before. It's nothing against the nothing against the author or anything, but I have a problem with how many concepts that library uh, groups into one. Like it tends to, it conflates the concepts of Netlink, the concept itself, Netlink sockets, the Netlink connection, the generic Netlink connection, the route Netlink connection, IP route two. Like it kind of has like five or six different concepts in one package. And I think that it just makes some unfortunate design choices. So I'm personally not a fan. Uh, that being said, you know, use what works, right? But the reason I started writing mine is because I was unhappy with some of the direction uh, of that package. So... It took a little bit to wrap my head around what Netlink really is. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think that package does a good job of telling you, you know, what Netlink is versus what the individual families are and et cetera. So that's all I really have to say. You know, I, I think I'm sure they're, I'm sure that they, uh, you know, they wrote it for their needs. Like perhaps it is convenient to have it all in one place. Uh, I personally just don't agree with the approach. That's all. But no harm, no foul. But if anybody writes an INET Diag package for my, somebody might have already done that actually, at least some limited portion, but if anybody writes one, please do link me. I will link it in my readme. I'm happy to do so. So why the heck, why do we have this space again? I don't understand. Huawei. But that's not. I'm not opposed to maybe doing a PR for that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. So if you mean like a PR to my Netlink package, you'd actually want to put it in a separate package. The idea being you have individual pieces which are composable. So for example, if the uh, INET Diag, I think is built on top of GE Netlink. So you would have an INET Diag package which imports my GE Netlink package. And you'd also import the Netlink package because that gives you the attribute portion. So three separate packages instead of one would be the goal. You received a level one hype train emote. Nice, very cool. <laughs> I, where the heck is this leading space coming from? I have no idea because strings join wouldn't do that, would it? I, I don't think it would. So let's see. I don't understand why. So it's that FSN. What's different about that code? Did I forget to use this? I did. <laughs> uh, oh no. You spend time looking at your own code and you expect there's like a bug in there. It's like, what's wrong? And it just turns out you just forgot to do something that's really trivial. And now it passes, of course. Oh, awesome. So you work on Uroot as well. Okay, nice. Uh, yeah, I've worked with uh, Chris Koch. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his last name, but Chris has worked on several other things. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, -oh. uh Yeah, in Uroot, we were going to move from Bish to JC Manetti. Yeah, right. I've never seen that. Oh, no, a code review. So I said a little bit ago, I don't really want to do one tonight because it's an abbreviated stream. So I didn't actually mean to claim that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I wonder if I can refund your channel points. I don't actually know how to do that. But otherwise, uh, let me know if you ever have anything and I'd be happy to give you a review. But I think I'd prefer not to do one tonight because we're just in a limited time. Oh, Taryn refunded it. Nice. I don't actually know how to do that. So thank you. I appreciate it. I did a little in Uroot, but I wrote something very different specifically for network devices rather than part of Linux boot. Okay, cool. Could Sandy check my blog post, I guess? Uh, yeah, I mean, potentially, let's see. I don't think I'll be streaming until probably next weekend, unfortunately, but uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to owe you one, or I guess if Taryn refunded your channel points, you can just do it again. 
But yeah, I would just prefer not to do one tonight because we're on limited time as is, and I kind of just want to get some work done on this, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so this passes. We are now using this code. Um, let's check the coverage. Looks pretty good. Going to be quiet now. Likely fall asleep soon with the stream still running. It's 147. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out late. I appreciate that. Always fun. I know it is definitely late for folks who are in Europe or elsewhere. Um, yeah, have a good night. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you all hanging out. I know this is very impromptu. I didn't intend on streaming, but I got home, I think, at 745, and I was like, yeah, I can stream for a couple hours, you know, so why not? I would like to make some uh, corner cases here for things like bad values for sure. So I think we'll probably... Uh, we could write tests for this type. I don't know if we really need to, though. So let's write some docs, and then we'll write tests probably that incorporate this, but... Uh, let's see. Error now values is returned when... Could you potentially have an empty string? If you include zero... Does that make sense? I don't think that makes sense, actually. So I think we could just add that to the constructor, this check. If len ss is zero, so there's nothing in the slice. Uh, return nil. So new at modem no values. Key value pair values provided for parsing. Something like that. Can remove that, and now we can remove this as well. Uh, just assuming we did the bounce, the effected bounce check here. So this is safe. Uh, two to parameterize the index. Uh, this access is safe due to the constructor bounce check. And since this is internal only code, I will treat it as a bug, and I'm okay with this panicking if I get it wrong because that's my that's on me. Yuna, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate that. A little hungry. I need some food tonight too. A value parser constructs uh, parses well typed values from a string slice input. New value parser constructs a value value parser from the input string slice. Lithium, hey, thank you so much for the subscription. Welcome back for two months. I appreciate that. Input string slice. Black Martian, thank you so much for the brand new subscription. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You all are very generous. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. New value parser constructs a value parser from the input string slice. Uh, the string slice must contain at least one element or it will return an error. Yes, enjoy your emotes. Enjoy your gophers and your tux penguin. <laughs> So my friend is an artist. I asked her about the emotes uh, probably a month ago now, like right after I got affiliate, and she has not said anything really since. I think she was busy for a little bit. Um, I will bother her, but I guess in the meantime, it's not that big of a deal if we have these emotes. People seem to like them. <laughs> we'll get nicer ones eventually, but I think we'll probably keep these around too, just for fun, you know. Uh, right, so... Remove any leading or trailing white space for parsing convenience. Figma can do vector image drawing. I'm not familiar with Figma, and there is a free one. These are amazing. Why would you get rid of them? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> See, I I did them as a joke, but I also kind of like them as well. I think it's just goofy, you know, because like my website is very minimal and simple. Like I'm clearly not a graphics person, so I think it kind of fits for a programming stream, you know, in some ways. But int returns, int parses the input as an integer. String parses the input as a uh, string with each slice value separated by a space. Slice value joined by spaces. 
I know it's kind of silly that I'm writing docs for my internal only code, but I pretty strongly believe in having docs for everything. <laughs> so I know it's a, it can be somewhat of a controversial opinion at times, but that's the way I write my code. So error returns the current parsing error if there is one. After each parsing operation, the caller must invoke the error method to determine if any uh, input could not be parsed as the specified type. Alt Q, nice. I like the emojis, but they had transparent backgrounds that fit better. Yeah, you might be right. The thing is, I didn't do transparent backgrounds because I wanted them to look kind of intentionally bad. But I guess what I could do is I could make it so that, like, the, the gopher's body is white or the outline of, like, tux is white. But I could trim the background off anyway. So I could still do that. Um, the thing is, with the with the error not equals nil one, I don't know what I would do. Like, I think I would pretty much have to leave that as is, right? But... Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will trim the background off the gopher and the tux at least. I just, I frankly, I did it that way because I thought it was funny. But I, I can see what you mean. So, uh, shoot. Right, got to update the call sites. Yep. Invert color palette, then transparent background. Oh, you mean for the air not equals nil? Yeah, potentially. I changed my mind. They're perfect how they are. Yeah, I, I feel like they have, like, I, I kind of intend for them to have kind of like a goofy, like, you know, a programmer made this charm for sure. <laughs> but I, I can see arguments for both ways. I mean, to be honest, I don't expect that people would subscribe to me for my emotes, but I think Jimmy and probably a few others did, but <laughs> it's pretty silly. It's all just for fun. What was I looking at? It's true, yeah. So Jimmy gave me $5 just because he liked my terrible emotes. Well, actually, I guess he gave me like 250 or something. Twitch is cut, you know, but... <laughs> Uh, we've got all these cases covered. Let's write a couple of cases that test the test these as well. So we want the value parser. We're going to add tests just in the device because we don't really need to write separate tests for this. We could, but I don't really care. I don't know. Maybe we will. It doesn't really matter, though. Now form key value. Uh, malformed integer. Right? Uh, yeah, something like that. And then this would be I M E I S V would be foo. Right? Oh, this actually parsed successfully. That's not good. Why? Is it because it's an empty string? I guess. Is it just a slice with an empty string in it? It's kind of silly, right? All right, I need a refill. I'll be right back. It is hot today in Michigan. At least it was, but BRB. All right, we're back. Oh, man. Anybody here playing uh, Last of Us Part 2? So I have a PS4. I've never played either the original or Part 2. I won't talk about any spoilers. Don't worry. But I've been watching a couple of my streamers play Part 2, and uh, it's it's heavy. It is a heavy game. Um, yeah, seems pretty cool. So maybe maybe I'll play that. Even though I, I know some of the spoilers now, but I've still missed pretty good chunks of it because I was unavailable. Masterpiece level so far, yeah, it seems it seems really awesome. Um, one of the streamers I'm watching, I think you're holding off with PS5. Yeah, I will definitely get a PS5 as well. That's gonna happen. Um, I've got a PS4 Pro right now, but yeah, it seems like it's a really good game. I I think the biggest criticism one of my streamers has had so far is that it seems like there's lots of like, you know, follow this person around for a long time, like versus gameplay like it's kind of like follow this person in this flashback and i don't know i mean the thing is is he's not really i don't think he's really giving the story a chance as much um i think it's for me i would be a lot more into the story 
Hope it's not hard to get, like, the past few console releases, not being able to get it for months. Yeah, I guess we'll see. I'll probably try and buy one on launch day. Um, I guess we'll see what happens, you know. But. Where are we? Oh, right. So this, for some reason, is accepting this as a empty string, which is probably not what I want. So, Q, VP, SMS. PS5, ugly AF. Yeah, it's, uh... I don't know how to feel about it for sure either. I think it's one of those things that's going to become, like, iconic. But it's definitely weird, right? I mean, look how weird the PS3 was, you know? PS5 is incredible on specs. Streaming straight from disc is possible. Yeah, I always say yes. I am super excited about that. I watched the tech presentation. I thought that was pretty cool. And also, the fact that it's going to have an NVMe, like, drive slot for expansion is awesome. Like, that is amazingly cool. That is a massive leap forward, you know? It may take over mouse and keyboard games. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think PC gaming will always exist to some extent, but... You mentioned empty value is acceptable, valid, actually. Yeah, see, I'm trying to understand, like, why it... I mean... See, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that the manufacturer would be empty, but I, I think I can see your argument, you know? Um, I guess it's probably fine. What was I trying to test then? I was trying to get this case where there's no key value pairs, so like the string slice is empty instead of length one. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to test that actually. Because I think it's always gonna return, even if there is nothing, it's gonna return a slice with element one, uh, a slice of length one, excuse me, with the element of empty string. So I guess it's fine. I don't really have to test that exact case, but let's just look at the coverage really quick. We don't need 100% coverage, you know? It's like, the thing is only going to give us, like, a fixed set of outputs anyway. I'm already doing more than I need to, probably, with this stuff, but it can't hurt, right? This seems fine. I mean, the constructor thing is something I would probably normally test, but we could be lazy. We could cheat a little bit. And as far as, like, these zero-value shortcuts, like, this is something I could potentially write a test for as well, but uh, I don't know. I think it's okay for the time being. I'll probably leave it alone and, you know, worry about it later. I'd like to parse some more values tonight, you know? Uh, cool. Let's go ahead and commit this. Do the old screen split here by me. There we go. <laughs> it's kind of funny because when I'm talking to you all, I feel like I should be looking at you. But it's like if I look straight at the webcam, it's really weird, huh? So I, like, I find myself looking up here at like my OBS window or looking over here at the chat. But I don't know. I haven't decided where I like looking yet. The thing is with looking at the, at the Twitch stream is that it's delayed, so it messes me up. So I find myself looking at the OBS views a lot more. <laughs> Streaming is a weird thing. It's, uh, I like it. I like it a lot, but it's it's definitely strange. I would say it's not like a natural thing for people to do, you know, but I tend to be pretty good about talking through my thought process and I, I enjoy having, uh, you know, looking around and stuff. It takes practice to look into the camera. Yeah, I feel like it's just weird though, like, when a Twitch streamer looks right at the camera, it's often kind of creepy. <laughs> I don't know. I still find it very strange to say that I am a Twitch streamer because it's not like my job or anything. It's just something I'm doing for fun, but you know. Anyway, uh, I think this is probably good to go. So let's take a look at the diff really quick. Yep, replacing all these calls before, which were SS1, now is the full string of the thing. So, that's good. Replacing this integer parsing. This is the real va this is the real value here. For anybody who's joined a little bit late, I think what's cool about this is you can replace all this verbosity with this int call and check the error once later on. You know, this works really well. You kind of are a Twitch streamer. I look forward to your streams. Well, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I wish I could do them more often. Um... I, I've i only done, I think, like, one weeknight stream so far. I would like to do them more, but the problem is is that after a day of typing, like, my elbow kind of bothers me sometimes, and I want to give it as much rest as possible, you know, so that way I can do my job effectively. And, like, even today, my, my pinky is tingling a little bit. It's not bad, but I think it's probably because of doing the Alt-Q shortcut for the auto format. I think I might have to remap that, actually, because I find that reaching with my pinky uh, will usually make my hands or my pinky fall asleep a little bit. So I actually have my shift remapped over to my right thumb because this is a lot easier. So, yeah, I've had a, I've had kind of like an RSI type thing going off my elbow for a few years now. It's actually gotten a lot better, thankfully. The ergonomic stuff really helps, but I wrote a blog about that if anybody's interested. Um, 
kind of discusses what I went through, the steps I took, the hardware I bought, etc. Um, you're an influencer. I'm not sure if I read that already, but yeah, it's kind of funny. I'm an influencer in my dreams, right? But I'm okay being a tech influencer, <laughs> if there is such a thing. No, it's more so that I, I enjoy doing these things, and I think that there's a lot of value in me sharing my knowledge. I know there are people who have been in here and they said like, wow, I never knew about that. Or I learned things from you all. You know, you all show me, for example, control L. Like, I cannot believe I did not know about that, you know, and I'm trying to get in the habit of using it. I'm under the influence a lot. Yeah, tell me about it. I had a, I had a pretty interesting day yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's a story I want to tell on stream, but I, I had a pretty interesting day. <laughs> When are you keynoting a conference? I think, you know, it's kind of funny, but I feel like the stuff I talk about is often too, maybe it's the wrong word, but too technical, too in-depth for like a keynote. Like, I don't think I'm really good at the high level thing, right? Like I very much am the, you know, we're going to go hard on this for 20 or 25 minutes about like this topic. And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of slides to look at later. Like the keynote thing doesn't really feel like me, you know, but who knows? I mean, assuming you're not joking, you're probably joking, but it's something I've thought about, like, oh, I could apply for the keynote, but it's like, eh, I don't know if that's really me, you know? Uh, implement value parser type for concise parsing. Keynotes are as easy as, yes, I generally agree. Um, there were a couple, there were a couple at, like, KubeCon that were pretty, uh, pretty bad, you know? And it is what it is. I, I shouldn't say bad. I should say they were not aimed at me, Right. So the stuff at KubeCon, for example, people announcing like things for their products or talking about their, you know, their journey with Kubernetes, like that's cool, but that's not get you, it's not aimed at like me, right? That's aimed more for like your, your managers and your CTOs, like people like, you know, uh, I want to feel confident using Kubernetes to build my business, but that's not what I care about, right? It's easier to read the tweet announcements than wake up early. Yes. Uh, considering every time you go to a conference, you are always drinking until 2 a.m. Uh, with <laughs> with Prometheus people. <laughs> KubeCon isn't aimed at us basically at all. Yes, that's true. For sure. Especially the one about 9P. Hey, your talk was awesome, man. That was very cool. That was one of the coolest talks I saw. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, the reason I go to KubeCon is to hang out with people. Uh, that's usually the easiest opportunity to see Prometheus folks, especially in the U.S. So... Uh, but GopherCon is still my favorite conference. And even then, I think GopherCon has had some kind of, some marketing spin. It's not bad. It's really not bad at all. But you can tell there's a little bit there. Um, but I don't blame them, you know. What is KubeCon aimed at? Don't tell me the containers themselves. Are they sentient yet? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Just newbies and getting orbs to adopt the tech. Yeah, I would say that's pretty much true. I couldn't join the first GopherCon I did my son being born. Oh, no kidding. I have been to every single GopherCon so far. So if you've been to other GopherCons, uh, yeah, I will be there. I'm planning on, well, it's in November this year, but I'm hoping to go, you know. Linux Foundation is a trade organization, so they're there to promote the businesses in the ecosystem. Yeah, makes sense. You know, I don't blame them. It's just, it's no longer what it it no longer provides a huge value to me as an engineer. You know, there are some very cool talks. Like whenever like the Cilium people do a talk, I always go to those. Those are very good, but um, it just depends, you know. What were we doing? You've all got me distracted. Just now got my side project on Docker, waiting for the server that I'm going into traffic. One of my to-do items is to get my main jobs app on Kubernetes. Nice. I am running traffic here at home as my... Uh, ingress for uh, all my stuff with doing Let's Encrypt TLS and such and basic auth, which is nice. Um, I don't run container. Well, I do run one Docker container for um, Prom Lens, which is a pretty cool tool, but I'm running a couple of NixOS containers now. Ooh, excuse me, dinner, um, which are pretty cool too. Oh, people are tweeting at me. What are we, we're going to parse stuff, right? More parsing. So we have the current time and the temperature. Okay, let's get more. Let's get more values. So once we have this framework in place, it is very easy to expand. So we can do things like uh, case. Let's see here. Reset counter. Reset counter equals VP int. 
Did I already add that as a struct field? I did. I just didn't parse it. Huh. Okay. So now if I run this, the tests fail because we are now successfully parsing this thing. So it literally took us two lines. And I think that's pretty much the best case you can ask for. Um, as mentioned, I can make it do like some reflection magic. So temperature goes into temperature, but I really don't like doing that. I don't think that's necessary for uh, fixed data like this. Like if this data was totally variable format, then yes, like JSON, you know, reflection makes sense. But I do not like reflection for this sort of code. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, some folks may feel differently. That's okay, you know, but... I tend to have uh, <laughs> strong opinions on a uh, Go. <laughs> I try to have them weekly held. I try to listen, but it takes a pretty persuasive argument a lot of the time to convince me that something I'm doing is, uh, <laughs> you know, not right. After I've been writing Go for like seven years now, so I feel like I've come into a pretty good set of practices. But that being said, I'm always happy to learn. You know, mode online. I wonder if this is like an enum. I feel like it probably is, but I don't know enough yet. So we're just gonna parse it as a string. Realistically, it will probably be a string with constants for things like online. Um, but I have no idea what sort of like modes this can return. Like things like the mode or the LTE CA state. Like I have no idea. So. Huh. Oh, you know, this key value pair is weird. I think we looked at this earlier with the reg expert thing, but EMMS, EMMS state registered normal service. Why is this spaced out? Does this imply these are separate fields? Like... I don't know. This is a weird one. I think in this case, it's going to be parsed as like registered normal service by my library. And I guess that's okay. But these might actually be totally separate fields. So we might have to adjust this later. I don't know. Let's add some more struct fields here. Um, reset counter. I like doing them in the order they appear. So mode, system mode, PS state. LTE band. These are all strings. Uh, you know, I, I go back and forth whether or not I like having these all on like one line like this. Um, it's kind of nice because you can simplify the types, but it could also be confusing. I don't know. If I'm documenting every field, I will definitely break them out. But in this case, I might leave them like this. Uh, we'll see. So now we have mode. We are going to have the... System mode, the PS state, and the LTE band. Okay. System mode. Uh, PS state. PS. What does PS stand for in modem terminology? I avoid Kubernetes outside of work. I'm having a... I'm hearing folks... You know, some folks are like, you know, don't run Kubernetes at home. <laughs> you know. And there was a little bit where I wanted to, but now that I'm running Nix OS, I really feel no need. Um, that being said, maybe I'll still end up setting up like an Intel NUC cluster or something, you know, NUC, whatever they're called. Um, haven't decided. I tried with Raspberry Pis, but I found them to be pretty, uh, pretty hard, especially because lots of Kubernetes things just assume just assume uh, AMD sixty four, which you know is what it is. LTE band. LTE band. Okay. Uh, beauty. Let's fix the test. Mode. Online. Yelling. All caps. EMM states. Nice. Thank you. Want to be an LTE expert? Sign up for our mailing list. Yeah, I'm good. So EMM is registered normal service. Interesting. Okay. I will bookmark this. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, for now, we're going to expose it as a string, but we'll see. Probably uh, lots of these things will be exposed as labels in Prometheus, so we can alert on different conditions. System mode LTE, right? PS state. I actually shut off the... Uh, I think my modem has fallback to 3G and HSPA plus, but I actually have those shut off <laughs> just for LTE because <laughs> I know my house has good LTE service. Uh, attached. LTE band B12. Is that B12 indicate? Did I parse that wrong? LTE band capital B? No. 
Oh, we're missing a colon. There we go. Yep. Uh, no. Want B12 got... LTE space band colon. Yeah. What's wrong with this? You want B12, you got nothing. Reset counter was parsed properly, but not LTE band? Was there an error? No, there wasn't an error because it would return one. Yeah, it's not being, oh, they pass what? Oh, I think I was reading old output. That's probably why. Yeah, they pass, okay. I was looking at old output. Actually use this one instead. It shows all the substates like limited service, etc., which would be useful. Yes, thank you, I appreciate that. Because this means that I can do things like write Prometheus alerts. So that's good, thank you. Yeah, this is all totally new to me. I have never dealt with LTE equipment before. Um, as far as setting up the device itself, I understand there's two protocols. So there's QMI, which is like Qualcomm's version for whatever. And there's also MBIM, which is like the USB standard. I am trying to use the MBIM, but uh, I mentioned earlier on the stream, actually, I might've had my microphone over here. <laughs> so what happened is I ordered radios or I ordered the radio and I got antennas, but I wasn't paying attention. I, I don't know anything about antennas. I just don't know anything. So I got antennas with the right connector, which was the... Oh God, what is it? Yuda LF on the modem side up to RP SMA, I think. Um, and I got antennas that fit, but the problem is I'm pretty sure they're Wi-Fi antennas, so they won't do like LTE frequencies. So I, uh, I made a mistake. <laughs> what are you going to do? So I'm getting new antennas tomorrow. Along with my new cable modem, which I can also export metrics from, so it'll be fun. I am buying the Netgear CM1200 because I have gigabit service and I want to have uh, headroom for the future. So we'll see. Okay, LTE bandwidth 5 megahertz. Yes, this is, this is what I think I want to split out. So BW, I assume, means bandwidth, right? But this means bandwidth as in like literally the frequency width of the band, not like in the network bandwidth sense, right? So I might call this like LTE bandwidth megahertz and that way you get the unit as well. LTE BW megahertz bandwidth. I'll probably spell it out. It's the width of the channel, like 20, 40, 80 and Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I kind of, that's what I kind of figured. I just wasn't totally sure, but it makes sense. So I think I'll probably type it out as like LTE bandwidth megahertz because this way it's more obvious. So the thing is, is like, if I say LTE BW5, like what does that mean? You know, that could be like an enum, it could be whatever else. So when in doubt, I like to include the unit in the struct field name. Uh, LTE RX chan, so LTE receive channel. So we're gonna spell these out too. LTE receive channel, LTE just be aware that I think, not sure that it could be fractional. Interesting. Hmm. I think we'll do an integer for now, but we can always fix it, you know. LTE transmit channel. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, 1.4, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20. Interesting, okay. We'll do a float, sounds good. So the bandwidth could be a float. Interesting. One twenty-seven. I expected this. Or int and register hertz. Jk. Oh, I guess I'm not sure. <laughs> I missed a joke. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll parse this as a float. That sounds good. We can add float parsing. Copy paste, as always. Float 64. I guess we could use like float 32, but nobody uses float 32, right? 
for clarity. Uh, I guess we don't really have to, right? Parse float. Uh, bit size, 10. This is, no, 64. What am I thinking? I was thinking base. Value, value, yes. Works, okay. Did we get the new ones yet? No, we haven't. So we've got down to LTE band. Now we have the bandwidth. So case, uh, LTE BW. Float 64. You want zero, you got five. Right, okay. It works. LTE RX Chan. Uh, the capitalization here is driving me nuts. Like the BW is all lowercase, RX just the R is capitalized, reset counter is two caps. Like, I guess I could do like, you know, I could strings lower it or something, but I don't know. I don't really care. It might make things a little easier if I do that, but eh, it's fine. It's fine for now. Channel is an integer, and then the transmit channel is also an integer. Yep, yep, yep. Right, right. LTE receive. You know, I'm wondering if I have this in like an HSPA plus mode or something, if it has different fields that are not like LTE related. Probably, right? Maybe I'll maybe I'll force my modem over to 3G and see what happens. Uh, excuse me. Oh, right. I was looking at this again and I'm like, why is this not passing? It didn't make any sense. But anyway. Cool, cool. Thank you all for hanging out tonight. I appreciate it. You know, kind of fun just to do a little bit of Sunday night hacking. And yes, this project is all open source, of course. So uh, go check out my AT modem package on GitHub. CA state. Okay. CA state. And the EMMs, EMM state, ugh. RRC state, IMS reg state, all strings. Probably a good place to stop. Link project. Oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, what LTE modem? I have the Sierra Wireless MC7455. Uh, yeah, my I should keep... I should keep that nightbot command up to date. How do I hang on a sec? Uh, commands edit project. Does this work? I know Taryn knows how to do this, but I can try and figure it out. Uh, let's see here. Project is this. That work? Yes, it did. Sorry. Yes, this is the current project. My AT modem package. Uh, I am wrapping another modem package specifically for doing interactions with a modem that speaks AT commands over a serial interface. Yep, I did get it. Nice. Oh, uh, yeah. So type theory. My LTE modem, LTE modem, uh, MC7455. This one right here. Their website's probably terrible. I bought this. I got it off of eBay. It was like $110, something like that. I was looking around for something that was mini PCIe because I understand some newer modems can fit into M2. But this one uh, does LTE up to 300 megabit per second. Um, using mini PCIe. And this just seemed like a pretty well supported, like decently liked modem. So this is what I went with. Of course, since I bought the wrong, uh, since I bought the wrong uh, antennas, I haven't actually been able to test it yet with like a ping, but tomorrow, that's the plan. LTE CA state. 
it seems like pretty much every modem had like pretty vocal uh, detractors. Although I was looking at the reviews for this one and I think people ended up ordering vendor locked ones or something and did not know how to unlock them because apparently what you can do is you can get like a USB adapter and then do the AT interface and then just basically overwrite it, like overwrite the, the Dell lock or the Lenovo lock and make it generic or the other way around. So for example, I'm using this in my PC engines board, which doesn't care at all. But if you've got like a Lenovo laptop, you could buy a generic one, do the commands to like make it think it's a Lenovo. And then as far as I can tell, it would work fine. I've seen a couple of links for doing things like that, but I don't have any of those devices, so I can't try. And also this is in my router, so. But if I get a laptop, I might end up doing something like this, but I probably need an M2 modem instead. Yeah, I don't actually own a personal laptop at the moment. I just for the time being have gotten by fine with my work one where I need a laptop, but Otherwise, I just get my stuff done here, you know? Um, CA state, LTE, CA, EMM. Yes, what's next? RRC. It's still unclear to me if this is two separate fields. I am gonna presume that they're one field, but I'm gonna leave it to do. No, what am I doing? Uh, EMMM, yeah. To do, need to parse differently due to tab between fields and modem output unclear it's the substate of that field okay it's that like if oh okay thank you so registered is the state and normal service is the substate okay maybe we'll end up parsing this as a different type i think so to do uh consider normal service can be limited service etc i see okay consider parsing as a state and substate field state and substate fields Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. I did not look through that yet because we're running on limited time tonight, but I appreciate you sending the link. I will definitely take a look at that tomorrow or perhaps after the stream tonight. Uh, RRC, VP, string. Yep. Uh, right. Uh, RRC, we did IMS reg as well, so... All these acronyms mean nothing to me. Like, I feel like with computer stuff, I'm normally pretty good at acronyms because I do, I guess, you know, first of all, like Linux, but then networking. Networking has so many acronyms, right? And I feel like I'm generally pretty good with them, but a lot of these are brand new to me, you know? Like LTECA state, I guess I would assume that means certificate authority, but like there's probably some kind of like lock-in based on the, I don't know. I, I just have no idea. <laughs> anything in telecoms is filled with opaque acronyms yeah that's what i'm starting to notice here <laughs> i mean isn't lte just a marketing term anyway like long-term evolution it doesn't actually mean anything right it's just uh it's kind of funny not assigned in all caps you know just in case you didn't know yeah I'm states uh, registered normal service seems fine rrc idle i have no idea what rrc means no idea. I have no idea what IMS means. No serve. Oh, what? You couldn't spell it out? Come on. Lazy modem. Carrier aggregation. Okay, that makes sense. LTE has turned 4G until marketing got involved. It was basically considered 3.9G. Yeah, my understanding is that, like, we don't actually ever reach the 4G spec speeds, right, with LTE. Maybe LTE advanced, but even then, like, Remote railroad communications? Are you serious? Wow. Um, really? Is that really what that stands for? I can't tell if you're messing with me, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was like an LTE modem and like a railroad device, <laughs> you know? I'm trolling. You are trolling. Okay. I was like, you know, I guess it would make sense that they'd have like a sensor with like an LTE thing to like track like the state of the trains. Radio resource control. That makes more sense. <laughs> Type theory. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. There is no trolling allowed in this stream. Absolutely none. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't really care. <laughs> uh, PCC, RxM, RSSI. Okay, now you're just messing with me. PCC, RxM. PCC, receive something. RSSI means something like the signal strength. I don't know, some mathematical garbage, right? <laughs> uh, I guess for this one, we're just going to leave it as an acronym for now. So PCC, RXM, RSSI. What a mouthful. 
RSRP DBM. Keep the unit. Uh, PCC RXD RSSI. Sprint was Southern Pacific Railroad International Tele Network Telecommunications. Really? So Sprint was formed out of a railroad company. I had no idea. RSRP. Oh, weird. This is the same field with different... Oh, shoot. Forgot to handle this in a special way. Resource, signal, reference, power, retrieve, sank... <laughs> I can't even say it right. Receive, strength, signal, indicator. Reference, signal, reference, power. Interesting. So this would seem to imply to me this is a different format. So actually with these, we have to parse both key values as one, which I guess we can do it as a special case within here. Kind of stinks, but we can do it. So these both have this RSRP DBM, but it accompanies the RXM versus the RXD. So we're going to have to parse those separately. So maybe we'll break these up a little bit to make them more obvious. So... RSRP, RXM, something like that. Uh, well, all these caps are hard to read. I'm trying to follow the Go convention. RXD, DBM, something like that. Int. I think we'll probably call them something like that. But. Two forty nine. Just wait till you get the second. There's a second connection status page. I've only seen this one so far. I've seen the LTE info command as well. I'm going to do that one next probably. But I did not know there was a second connection status page. I had no idea. If that's the case, uh, yeah, let me know. Oh, you are joking. Okay. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was some garbage like, oh, what is it? So AT exclamation point G status question mark one, right? That's a joke initialism. Gotcha. The thing is, like, all this radio stuff is brand new to me, so I just have no idea. PCC, RXM, RSSI. <laughs> right. So for this, we might not actually use the value parser. We might do something special. Um, haven't decided yet. We'll see. Actually, the problem is, though, is that it would get passed as two separate parse calls. So we might need a special case in here. Which is unfortunate, but uh, we'll figure it out. I know many, if not most, of the acronyms and absolutely no idea what a good or bad value is in them. Yeah, telecoms is cray cray. That's kind of what the impression I'm getting here. Like, it occurred to me the other day, I actually have no idea like what even like a good Wi-Fi value is, right? Like negative 80 dBm. Is that good? I don't know. You know. It's just the kind of thing I never really have to play with like telecom stuff or like, you know, wireless really. So this is all pretty new to me. So yeah, we're gonna need to parse these separately. So we either need to add some state here to keep track of which one we saw last, which I guess we could do, but uh, I guess it's not. Mm. Mm. I have an idea. I'm not sure if I like it, but I think it'll work. D DBM is DB against one milliwatt. So one watt is like nine D oh nine DBM because that makes total sense. Yeah, right. Right, now we have the RSSI values, which need to be parsed separately. Ugh, my throat's a little sore today. 
and just talking and talking doesn't make it easier, but that's okay. I'm not going to be a super long stream, so. I uh, I think I know what I'm going to do here. I don't really like it, but we're going to do it. We're going to go with it. I'll explain in a sec. So if the last value seen was this or this, we're going to set some kind of like enum here, basically. So I think the status is going to carry an unexported field that indicates which of these was last parsed. Kind of stinks, but it is what it is, you know. Uh, type status state int const. Uh, we'll do this. We'll do this that way. The zero value is uh, an error, which is good, probably. I have a, uh, status state. So um, let's see here. Rxm last. Uh, Rxd last. I'll show you what I. I'll show you what I'm going for in a sec here. Excuse me. Oh, I just realized we don't have a dot comma in this type. I always use dot comma, so I'm surprised I forgot. Uh, status contains the modems current radio status. I have dealt with DBM almost once every week or so for 12 years, and I got that wrong. It's 30 DBM equals one watt. You can see why there's so few people staying in this industry now. <laughs> yeah, right. Taryn, you're a moderator. You can't post a lurking emote. Like, I know. Like, I mean, I guess you might be lurking at the moment, but you're not really a lurker. <laughs> I think we do have some lurkers near, though. There's, there's some folks hanging out. Uh, Black Martian, if you're still around, I appreciate you subscribing. Uh, you're quiet. You might be on a phone or something. I don't know. But thank you for the sub. I appreciate that. As far as I can tell, this is your first time in the stream today. So, hey, I, I appreciate that. I'm glad you like the stream. Sorry for calling out lurkers. You know, I'm not trying to. Just uh, want to let them, want to let them know I appreciate them. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be, depending on the last parse state, we're going to modify what we do next in this thing. So... Uh, S state equals RxM last. So that's the field we parsed last. This will be state equals RxD last. So this will tell us which of these we parsed last, and as a result, which one we need to parse next, or which field we need to parse into. So Uh, status state allows for some state to be kept while parsing status, status fields. Status state allows for now. Stores temporary state while parsing status fields. Possible status state values which Indicate alternative parsing code paths. So what we're going to do now is RSRP DBM. So switch on S state. Given RXM last, you parse this into uh, S dot, oh gosh, RSRP RXM DBM VP int. And given RxD last, you do it for the other field. So this works. It's kind of unfortunate we have to add a field to our status type. I guess we could potentially put it somewhere else, but it doesn't really matter. This struct is going to be pretty big anyway, so... What's uh, eight more bytes, you know? I guess I can make it like a uint8, but I feel like it would just be padded out to the next like machine word size anyway, so... Default, uh, panic, invalid state transition. AT modem, invalid status state transition. But I guess this could also be triggered based on malformed input. So while panic is probably what I want, I think this probably needs to be an error instead. Because, for example, if this RSRP shows up in the input before either of these, we don't know which one we're parsing into. So this is a test case we can write. So we'll do an error instead. Uh, nil format error f. 
AT modem. Uh, cannot parse RSRP DBM DBM value. Cannot determine which RSRP DBM value is being parsed. That seems fairly explanatory, you know. Uh, let's see here. This value is parsed into different struct fields. This key is reused for multiple fields. So the value is parsed into different struct fields depending on the previous parser state. Right. Uh, what did I do? Alt Q probably. Or, okay, there we go. Panic. Yeah, see, it panics now. So we got a. Did we just hit this crash? Oh, unexported. Ah, uh, great. Yeah, we want to ignore the unexported actually in this. So, so if you're using GoCMP, as soon as you have an unexported field in the struct, it will panic. It wants you to either explicitly opt into comparing the unexported fields or ignore them. In this case, we want to get rid of them. Seems fairly explanatory. Famous last words. Did I say that? Maybe I did. <laughs> Oops. The funny thing about uh, ignore unexported for the status state, right? Uh, ignore the exported fields for a status, for an AT modem status. Yes, I think that works. Yeah, I have a tendency to say stuff like that and it'll go back and bite me. That's why I write good comments, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is mostly sane. Um, you know, it seems it seems like it'll be fine, but we'll write good tests. You may not agree with the way I write all code, but I would think you'd have to admit that I write pretty good tests. <laughs> uh. Malformed. Uh, let's see here. So malformed. Uh, invalid status state. Uh, invalid parsing state. Right. That passed? How? It should have failed. RxM last is one. Rx this should, this should be zero, right? Or no, it should be. It should return an error. Why is this not erroring? Did I get this case wrong? RSRP DBM. I forget something. No. Oh, I got I got the case wrong. Ah, uh, why? There we go. There we go. Okay, test passes. We're good. Maybe I should make these all lowercase. Honestly. I don't know. Maybe I will, but I'm not going to bother for now. Shoot. Uh, what did I just do? Okay, we're good. With the username like Type Theory, uh, how do you feel about Go? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this, this is right now. So these RSSI states are right, but now I need the RSRP, right? That's what I was going for. Uh, RxD is, RxM is first, right? So negative 113. And then the RSRP. RS, R, I can't even say it. So this is improperly capitalized. Is it really? I So I was going with the, uh, oh, you're right. It is. Oh, shoot. You are right. Thank you. You do like Go. Nice. Okay. Good to hear. It's just funny. Whenever I see folks who are into like, you know, functional programming and such, uh, they generally are not as big a fans of Go. You know, that's okay. Uh, it's not for everybody, but I, I like the language, you know. Uh, yes, you are right. I will fix that. And the M, too. Yes, you are right. I flipped it. You are completely right. I flipped both. Right, right, right. Oh, these struct field names are a mouthful, but I can expose them at least in nice ways in Prometheus, and I will actually explain what these all mean in the Prometheus metrics as well. <laughs> Rainbow Comic Sans. Not gonna happen. <laughs> I saw somebody actually just released a tool called, uh, what is it, Pride Cat? That seems pretty cool. It, like, prints out your text in, like, rainbow-like output in your terminal. It's 
pretty cool stuff. Uh, by the way, we are coming up on about 15-ish minutes left in the stream. Short stream today, my apologies. Uh, thank you all for hanging out, though. I appreciate it. It's been fun. I think we've learned a little bit, you know. We've made some good progress. I explained my value parser type. Um, could probably get the status done. Comic Sans Terminal, I might cry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> no thanks. Let's get this done. We got a few more left. So we have the TX power, which is negligible at the moment. That's that's good. That's a value we're going to have to account for. So uh, I wonder if we're... I feel like this is going to be an integer, but right now it's just blank blank. So maybe I add a special case for parsing this as zero, right? I mean, I feel like that's probably reasonable, but... Two negatives make a positive. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's true. Transmit power is probably going to be an integer, I assume. Probably. TAC is some kind of serial number, I think. RSRQ, RSRQ, DB. Is a float, 64. And we'll do SINR, DB as well here. Attack, cell ID. We're going to cheat a little bit, so cell ID. All right, yep. So four more fields to do. We have the five more fields to do, transmit power. So we're gonna have to add a special case for a value parser, I think. Probably, I don't know if this is exactly right or not, but what I'm gonna assume is this is probably an integer. Maybe it's a float. We're gonna add a special case. So if you see dash dash, treat it as zero, right? Um, BPSS equals dash dash. Zero. To do, verify the correctness of this assumption. Assume that assume this means zero value good enough for now. Case TX power with a capital P, of course. Um, TX power. Transmit power. I like to spell that out. Uh, int. You might want to alert on zero. Yeah, probably. At the moment, my LTE radio, I think I've got the uh, powered off. So maybe a bad value like negative one. I think I'm going to leave this as is for now, but you might be right. Perhaps this there's difference between slash slash and zero or dash dash. Maybe it means like... Maybe this should be like a pointer, so you could have a null option as well. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it alone for now, but I do see what you're getting at, I believe. Unknown, yeah, makes sense. So after TX power, we have the tech field, TAC. PP string. We'll do cell ID too, case three, weird. string and then floats so rsrq db how do you legally test lte modems just hope the fcc does not notice i have no idea so are you talking like if you're like an lte modem manufacturer um yeah i, I have no idea there's a massive testing rig suite interesting okay rsrq db yeah, S R S R Q D B equals V P float sixty four. Uh, I got that capitalization wrong again. There we go. Capital B. Yep. Thanks. I I suspect that this is probably a very regulated thing, right? Seems like all the wireless, like, telecommunication stuff, they take very, very seriously. Like, I know, for example, like, you're not even allowed to, like, broadcast your own, like, FM radio beyond, like, a certain power level and stuff. RSRQ for quality, not power. Oh, yeah, RSRQ, DB. Yep, you're right. Thanks. Assuming that's what you meant. RSRQ, S-I-N-R. Yeah? Yeah. 
The thing is, I, I keep looking at I keep looking at these like all these acronyms. And I'm just getting them mixed up, you know. But thanks for that. It's one of those things where I would have figured it out like later, you know, when the test broke or something on my own. But I appreciate it. I think one of the coolest things about Twitch, really, in doing the programming thing, is that you get the opportunity to kind of do a pair of programming in this way. You know, it's kind of different. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. So uh, there we go. Seven. You presumably know SINR is SNR, but with interference too. And, oh, okay. I wasn't sure what the I stood for. Yeah, I, I figured it was SNR, but cool. Okay. So an SINR of 0 0.6 is really bad, meaning I need better antennas. Or I need antennas that are not for Wi-Fi. They're for LTE instead. <laughs> Oops. Maybe it's just the sign of the power and radiance. Who knows? Yeah, exactly, right? That's kind of what it, that's one of the things my, it's one of the places my mind actually went. Um, uh, negative 13.5. Oh, mustache. Uh, mustache is making my nose itch. It's the worst. 0 0.6. That's pretty bad. We're definitely going to put some new numbers in here. Whenever I get this online, I'm going to make a new test case. So, all right, cool. I think we have all the fields parsed. Good stuff. Is there anything else we want to use or we want to do in the meantime? I'm trying to think. This package is in pretty good shape. I have not started the Prometheus portion yet. I might do that off stream because I'm probably going to want data on this before next weekend, but we'll see. This looks pretty good to me. Go ahead and get this committed to Git. Eric.dev, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Uh, what am I going at some? What happened? Uh, we pull a new version of something? X errors, weird. Go mod tidy. Still changed, okay, no idea. Change the modem's current radio status, rights, current time, temperature, reset, counter, all these new fields. So many fields. Status, state. Our new values. RSRP DBM. Right, with our parser logic. Oh, maybe importing this CMP ops package changed something, huh? Invalid parsing state, yes, because we got into a state transition we did not expect because we saw this RSRP field before any of the previously indicated fields, which tells where it goes. We fill out the rest of our test fixture. We ignore that. If it's unexported, I think we're good to go. Why am I pulling in more stuff? Testify, why? Why is testify my go sum? Oh, uh, I don't understand go module sometimes, you know? Like, you look at some of this stuff and it's like, why? Uh, I don't know. Doesn't really matter, I guess. Ah, that dot comment is wrong. We should fix that. We can do better. Uh, float 64 parses the input as a float 64. Again, we could parameterize the index. So for example, if you access index zero or one, but it seems like zero is always what we want right now. So. When in doubt, go mod tidy. Yeah, for real. But it seems like go mod tidy just added more stuff to my go mod file, so I, I have no idea. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not like it. I think the go sum is for totally separate purpose. Anyway, it's for the you know the checksum database and everything. But my only direct dependencies are these, which makes sense. I guess we could test test some more corner cases for this. It's probably be a good idea. Got about 10 minutes left, a little less, so I think we could possibly do that. I'm pretty good at making tests pretty fast, so let's commit this. Uh, go.sum and all the Go files. When an even more down truncate go.mod to let it populate again. Yeah, I actually did that yesterday because I couldn't understand why like testify and stuff was in my go mod, and it came back anyway. And I was like, alright, well I guess we're uh I guess we're doing this now. <laughs> 
uh, finish parsing for status. Awesome. All right, I'm feeling bad about this value parser. Let's write some more tests. I want to nail down the corner cases and make sure it's in good shape. So I can write tests in six minutes time, no problem. Uh, let's see here, package, uh, AT modem, AT modem, uh, test, value parser errors. So possible things that could lead the value parser to be upset with us. So I have a pattern I like to use. So failed to create value parser, expected an error. Yeah, something like this. So what we're gonna have, actually I think I had code very similar to this in device. No, I don't know. Anyway, I'll show you what I, I'll show you all of what I mean. Uh, so we have the value parser constructor, new value parser, given a set of inputs, which will be TTSS for input string slice. Uh, we expect these are all errors actually. So yeah, we don't care. We want everything to return an error. So what we'll have is roughly something like error error A and error B. So Given an input, we provide a function which is invoked on top of the value parser, and the function will modify the state of it in some way that error B will return an error. So what this will happen is either, uh, let's see here. So we need this to, if, how do I want to do this? I'm trying to do this in like a concise way, but of course, concise and go are not always the correct way. It's not always the correct way to do things, right? So, uh, this is probably, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think we probably want to make it so that we have either uh, Construct, okay, so if the constructor, if the constructor should be, should allow this, then something like this, so if construct okay and the error is not equal to nil, yeah, so failed to create value parser. Uh, construct okay, expected a constructor error, expected a, yeah, something, something like this. Uh, did you do the go mod y thing to find out why testify is being readed? No, I did not. I actually forgot all about that command until you mentioned it just now. Uh, we could possibly look at that in a sec. I just kind of want to try and get this done if I can. So, uh, let's see here. So, bad empty slice input will return an error. So, construct should be not okay. And then everything from here on out should return an error. So we invoke the function, invoke the function, and assume that any operation performed will return an error. So if we do this and error colon equals VP error, if error is equal to nil, the test fails, T fatal, expected an error, but none occurred. So expected a non nil vp dot error error yep something like that and we'll log the other errors so construct error log this as parse error i like to have these if i don't want to inspect the actual contents of the error because oftentimes i just don't care about like looking for specific error cases uh yeah i'm doing that i'm keeping the scope wider on purpose because I want to capture, I want to use it out here as well. Um, I could do an else here, but I don't really like else. <laughs> so this is just another one of those like personal preference things. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of silly, but I, you know, I have my little preferences for stuff. So empty slice input, uh, let's run the tests. They pass, okay. So we are getting the empty slice case, excellent. Uh, let's see here, so let's do some more cases. So name, uh, 
bad float. So given a string slice, which contains foo, uh, if we call a function on the value parser, which is vp float 64, and we know we're ignoring it on purpose, this should return an error, which it probably does. Expected a constructor error? No, right, so this constructs okay, so there's nothing inherently wrong with this value, it's just that we cannot interpret it as a float. So that works, right? Uh, bad float, bad int, same idea. Yep. And are there any other cases we have not got in here? Uh, we guess we could test these cases for if there's an error already with the input, then it should always return zero. So something like, uh, Nah, uh, it's probably okay. I think this is good for now. We're running out of time anyway. We just crossed over at 10 o'clock. So I am going to wrap this up and we are going to wrap up the stream. And we will see if we can throw anybody a host and raid. I'm very curious if anybody is streaming right now. Large data bank is streaming? No way, really? Did he stop streaming and start streaming again? We're gonna send large data bank a raid in a sec here, but lovely watching as always, thanks for sharing. Yeah, no problem, I'm always happy to. I, uh, I enjoy this, you know, it's a good time. Uh, let's see here, so AT modem, uh, value parser, error test cases. Yep. So thank you all for watching, it's been a blast. Uh, nice little short stream tonight. If you want, you can check out the AT modem package on GitHub, this is github.com slash mdlayer slash AT modem. So it would appear that large data bank is streaming still. Uh, I wonder if he left OBS on, but we're gonna send him a raid anyway, so we'll find out. Well, I guess first let me pull up his stream and uh, pull up his stream separately and make sure he actually is streaming because he was in the chat earlier. Oh, so he's in my chat right now. Are you streaming? Why is the raid thing telling me you're streaming? You're not. That's so weird. Okay, well, I guess we've got nobody to raid tonight. So, yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I will catch you all later. Have a good one. See ya.